now through the miracle of technology, with a distance of 2,200 miles, <laughs> from the Atlantic coast to the Inner Mountain West, it's Jake Smith and yours truly, Bill Colley, with Boardwalk Potatoes. Bill, uh, we, we received a lot of uh, comments from last week's podcast. I know I had to hire a bodyguard. <laughs> I think there was a senator, uh, Rand Paul. Did he have to hire a bodyguard coming out of the White House the other night? Talk about, talk about how sad that is. I mean, I mentioned this on my show yesterday. We are going to pay, you and I, all of us are going to pay for Secret Service level protection for every elected official, every appointee in Washington, we're going to pay for that because we've allowed our nation's capital and every U.S. city to just fall into, into bedlam. What do, you, what do you think? Well, what really disturbed me this morning, and I was reading a, a story in the Washington Post, uh, sometimes known more correctly as Pravda on the Potomac. Or the compost. <laughs> well, I'm a Washington compost. That's why I guess what you make compost out of. Yeah. Uh, the uh, story details the fact that uh, we have gotten to a point where there's not a lot of what you might call dialogue going on between various political sides and these controversies. And, but what got me about the story, and this just shows you how typical media portrayal of it is, they mentioned in Tyler, Texas, a right-wing group showed up to confront a left-wing group that was planning on tearing down a Confederate statue. Right. And they show you a photograph of a guy at a Trump hat. He's got his hands around under the chin of a liberal, shoving the liberal against a vehicle. And it says, you know, that this was a violent confrontation. It says, and there have been other violent confrontations and uh, deaths as well in places like Portland. But it doesn't say who started those violent confrontations in those liberal cities. It just says, here's a bunch of right-wing people behaving badly. And then there's violence in other places, too. But it doesn't say who instigates that violence. Oh, but but there's peaceful protests for the most part, Bill, right? uh, (laughs) There's a great uh, Babylon Bee story out yesterday that talks about CNN over the last couple of thousand years, how CNN has covered various stories, and you know, <laughs> most peaceful crucifixion and <laughs> oh, sh- things, things along those lines. How does anybody believe that? I had a boss. He has multiple Murrow Awards. He was the yeah. news director for 21 years at Camo X Radio in St. Louis, which is a, you know, one of the, the, the top Clear radio channel. You can hear it all over the country at night, right? He, he saw that story from CNN the other day where the guy is, this is the second time where the guys, it, it looks like the scene at the end of Full Metal Jacket with the flames in the background and the guy standing out there saying, oh, mostly peaceful protest. And he said it was the biggest bunch of baloney. And, and my, my buddy John has a background, not only in radio, but television. And he fought in the Vietnam War. And right. he just said that the, the, the media is completely out of control in this country. Oh, there's no question. And, and they, 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 have, uh, they have become the uh, propaganda arm of this insurgency, there's no question about it. When you have Rachel Madcow uh, say, and, and, I, and I'm paraphrasing, but this is what she said last week. I think it was first or second night of the RNC, and she said, "You know what? We really don't want to be doing this, but we're told we have to." What does that tell you? What would David Brinkley have said? Uh, what would John Chancellor have said about that kind of comment? Now, we re- you remember? Uh, I was watching NBC the night that uh, Reagan beat Jimmy Carter back in 1980. Now, there was shock on a lot of the Alphabet Network's faces, but did they utter any of those kinds of things? Was there any of that kind of claptrap that is really taking this uh, this nation down today? And CNN, MSNBC, if you want to watch them, go ahead, but it's garbage, total garbage. There is no news content whatsoever, none. They 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 are driving, though, this rage because they have been portraying uh, anybody with an R behind their name or to the right of that, obviously, the enemy. is evil for so long. Right, they're uh, the enemy. Rand Paul, who he wants to bring troops home, doesn't want to send your kids to fight wars overseas. He sponsors a bill uh, for no-knock raids uh, to, to ban them. Uh, he, he's, he, he wants you to keep more of your own money. This is the third time someone's tried to kill him. Uh, you, you, it, he is the most mild-mannered. Indiv- I missed him by a few minutes. He's a medical he, doctor, by the way. Pediatrician, is he not? Uh, he, he does a lot of pro bono work. Uh, I'm not quite sure what his, his specialty is. Yeah, I missed it by a few minutes. Bill. He came in and visited a group of campaign workers. on. A, I was working on a campaign in Michigan in 2014, and I missed him by just a few minutes. And everybody in the office said, oh, he was just a wonderful presence while he was there. So, so why sooner? And, and, you know, when somebody does pull out a gun and, and shoots back to protect themselves, that's the, the individual who ends up getting charged with a crime. 
And right. I, 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 but, but the problem is, as somebody said to me, whether it's in Kenosha or whether it's in St. Louis, doesn't matter. The 17 year old boy should have stayed home. I, I believe that. But as someone told me on my program yesterday, 17 year olds shouldn't have to be going out and doing this because some adults have abdicated their responsibility. Well, that, that's great. Uh, <laughs> Bill, we are getting closer and closer to open warfare in the streets. I feel it. I think we've seen the beginning of it. And I think that uh, people who are gun owners, and they are legal gun owners, uh, it's almost as if a red line in the sand has been drawn, and they're uh, they're being dared to cross that line. They're being double dog dared. Someone's going to fire another shot. It's going to be the Fort Sumter moment. It's going to happen, Bill. It's coming, and it may happen before November. What do you think? Well, uh, I, I heard a good comment from a friend of mine who hosts a, a gun show. Uh, and he's got a podcast that's listened to all over the world, and he was telling me a couple, a couple of days ago that he thinks that the situation in Wisconsin is actually, he said, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it's, he said, I believe that this is almost a plant in the sense that it will allow someone to step in and then put down some iron discipline uh, and, and, and suddenly say, hey, in order to quell all of these disturbances, his, his fear is it is driving us closer and closer to a, a martial law situation and the end of the republic. Look, when you got clowns walking around saying he's going to force everyone in the country to wear a mask, uh, these are people who are willing, more than willing to do that uh, in order to, to, to get their agenda in place. So they, they almost Just yesterday, the Kamala the commies, she doubled down yesterday on that mask threat, did she not? Well. I, you know, the question becomes, because I live in a place where it's been kind of a loose type of, you know, somebody said, you should wear one, and a couple of counties ordered it, and nobody bothers. Uh, I, when I hear that, I like to say, you and whose army? But I think that they have, they have grand designs that have already figured that end of it out. It's, it's those wearing those masks, Bill, and we really don't know, sci- it's all about the science, right, Joe? But we really don't know whether those masks work yet. There are legal aspects to this. I have someone coming on my radio show this coming week, talks about uh, upcoming lawsuits with respect to these wearing of masks. But the bottom line is for the socialist Democrats, clearly wearing a mask is a sign for them that they have beaten us, that they control us. These masks are all about control. Wearing that mask in public is a sign of their control over us. I firmly believe that. What do you think? Well, if you think about this, if if you went along with uh, the stay-at-home order and then you went along with the mask order, when they come and say you've got to turn in your guns, are you the type of personality who would resist or just say, well, I guess I'm going to have to? Well, maybe the words of the Constitution, a well-armed militia will have a better meaning, Bill. What do you think? Uh, yeah, but there aren't going to be many of them. I, I, a lot of, you know, my, my experience in, in uh, a couple of decades of talk radio is uh, you got a lot of people who they love to call a radio show invent, and it's cathartic. I'm not going to say though that uh, beyond the bluster, I'm not sure that there's really any uh, serious metal there. I hear you. Have you tasted any good beers lately? <laughs> well, now that you mention it, <laughs> surprise! Uh, uh, I was doing a review earlier this morning on uh, the Powderhouse uh, uh, Brewing Company. Uh, here in wow. it's, it's in Boise, Idaho, and they make a Scotch ale that I told you about called yeah. Heaven's Gate Scotch Ale, which I think is delightful. And uh, this is one of the uh, they they have a stable of beers. It's interesting because though during the uh, the actual lockdown, they couldn't ship beer, and I, I emailed oh, right. the brewery and yeah. I said, you know what gives? There's there's no Scotch ale on the shelves, and they wrote back and they said, well, we're kind of locked down too. And then as soon as uh, we we moved out of the most severe restrictions, the uh, the product started reappearing on the shelves. But they are. For a, for a regional brewery, they are, I think, among the best. And it's Powderhouse, and the house is spelled H-A-U-S in the traditional German style. Oh, right, yeah. And, uh, and, and I was commenting in the uh, – I'm going to actually post this a little bit later today, but I was commenting in the review that no matter where you go in the country, there are some fine breweries. An interesting story here. One of the best breweries – there's a small town in Idaho of 800 people up in the northern panhandle. Yeah. It had two microbreweries that are both very popular. And tourists flock there, and part of the reason is they go to the microbreweries. Well, you know how important beer production is? Back in the um, mid-1800s, during the Victorian era, there was a pandemic of typhoid fever in London, Bill. And do you know that there was one section of London that was not affected by typhoid fever? And that's where the brewery was. 
because the, the alcohol from the beer and the fact that the, the workers at that brewery drank beer all day rather than the polluted water, which was carrying the typhoid virus. Bill's going to drink. <laughs> can I, can I, take can I share something plug. with you? It's the hydroxychloroquine of its <laughs> day, right? You know, that might be a, a, an interesting uh, beer brew. We have to let the president know about that. Hydroxychloroquine beer. beer. But, uh, <laughs> but that's a true story uh, that uh, they, it, they didn't know where this uh, typhoid, um, uh, the, Victorian, uh, the, the Victorian government had no idea where this typhoid outbreak was coming from. The water supply was polluted. And when they figured out that people who worked at the brewery weren't getting sick because they drank beer all day long, they realized their beer, their water went through a processing at the, uh, uh, at the, uh, at the brewery and all the impurities, the, the harmful bacteria was, uh, was boiled out, I guess, or, or, or brewed out. And those people were safe. That's how they, they were able to isolate where the typhoid outbreak was coming from, the water supply. Uh, and, you know, the English still three sheets to the wind for the most part every day. Uh, don't have any worries, I suppose, because of that. Although they've got people who are now coming into their uh, their country by in droves who, uh, you know, they, they they don't believe in using <clears throat> tissue paper, and you could always end up with a similar <laughs> situation, I suppose, on the Thames River. Oh, okay, Bill. Uh, before before we wrap up this board uh, this boardwalk potatoes, I'm Jake Smith, Bill Colley. This is uh, a board boardwalk potatoes podcast. Uh, your thoughts on last week's RNC? I thought it was a home run. Let's put it this way. I thought it was a grand slam for President Trump and the Republicans. Your thoughts? I, I think that if nothing, there's no great crisis and nobody's down yet screaming that he caused the hurricanes in Louisiana. Not I yet. Think, not yet, but I think he's going to uh, win re-election. Uh, th just the numbers have already been turning in his favor before the convention. Kathleen Parker, who's a anti-Trump columnist at the Washington Post today, said it was a far better production than what we saw from the Democrats, which looked like a Zoom meeting. And she said uh, that just the fact an, it looked very amateurish, Bill, very amateurish, very much so. And and she said, and then you look at the regular people who told their own stories at the RNC. Yeah, it was a home run. Who had more diversity at at, uh, uh, at their the, the DNC or the RNC? Which uh, I thought the RNC had by far and away more diversity. They had gays. They had blacks. They had Hispanic successful business owners. They had people from all, men and women from all walks of life were speaking on behalf of President Trump and they were speaking positively about what the president has done for this nation. By far and away, more diversity, the Republicans, who would have thought it possible 30 years ago that the Republicans would have had a convention with more uh, diversity uh, across all lines in this country than the Socialist Democrats? What do you think? Yeah. Uh, there's going to be a future ticket there, and it's going to involve Tim Scott and Christy Noem, and I don't know which one is at the top and which one is number two, uh, but I think that was evident after watching the proceedings. Great. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any doubt, uh, any doubt of that. This has been a podcast, Boardwalk Potatoes. Bill Colley, Twin Falls, Idaho, Jake Smith here on the Delmarva Peninsula. Bill, uh, I look forward to uh, talking with you next week. And uh, by the way, I'm going to be uploading today to board to boardwalk potatoes a movie review that i did on the movie fatima bill you and i are both roman catholics i don't know if you've seen it yet you must see this movie i can order it and actually watch it on tv i looked it up this morning on your advice you will be blown away and uh, it is uh, it is by far actually i don't i don't spend money on movies anymore this is by far uh the the best religious movie i think uh since mel gibson's the christ and perhaps the song of Bernadette. Those are my three favorite uh, uh, religious movies, one, two, and three. I saw one on the Cristero War a few years ago, and I might throw that into the mix too. Uh, but you're right. Uh, there are very few movies that are done for the faithful that actually have good production values. And I saw the trailer for Fatima, and it looks just outstanding. This movie, this movie was released now for a reason, Bill. It's providential. There's no doubt about it. And when you watch it, you will see it's all about communism, and I talk about that in my, my uh, movie review. Bill Colley, Twin Falls, Idaho. Jake Smith here on the Delmarva Peninsula. We'll talk to you soon. Boardwalk Potatoes is the podcast. William, have a great day. You too, sir.